Hey everyone, okay, fair warning to my longtime listeners. I'm sure you've heard me ramble on ad infinitum concerning my reasons for not believing in God, and I have to admit this is something of a last minute episode. Recently, I've been planning on rebooting or reinventing the podcast by changing up the format. And I was going to reintroduce myself to the audience in a sense. And the first episode was going to be me going over my reasons for being a non-believer. But I've put the format change on hold. I recorded a video, but when I watched it back, I gave myself the douche chills and thought, not quite ready for prime time. But I didn't want to let a perfectly good outline go to waste. So I thought I'd salvage the topic idea and turn it into one of my standard episodes. So here we go, my list of reasons why I don't believe in or at least strongly doubt the existence of God. And these aren't necessarily in order of importance. I've just numbered them arbitrarily. But first up is the man-made nature of religion. As someone who has a love of mythology and ancient religion, this is something I realized rather early on. We have numerous extant religions, the Abrahamic faiths, Christianity, Judaism, Islam. We have all the Eastern religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, etc. And uh, then there's assorted others, Zoroastrianism, different forms of animism, ones I've probably never even heard of. Uh, And then, of course, all the extinct religions we now relegate to the graveyard of mythology. All those charming old deities that we now consider mere figments of the imagination, which ancient people used to believe in, and I, I imagine believe in just as sincerely as people believe in their concepts of God now. And it is true that there are some common threads or similarities that we can find in some of the world's diverse religions. I remember watching one documentary where the host was interviewing people in India about Krishna, and they were talking about how, in some ways, the nativity stories are so similar that we have these Indian people who sometimes identify uh, Krishna with Jesus. Um, And we might find flood narratives from around the world and and things like that, or even... um, similar concepts of oneness, Uh, like we might find in Eastern religion, but there's also similar ideas in Christian mysticism, etc. But generally speaking, these different beliefs are often contradictory Uh, in in their texts. Sometimes the texts not only contradict each other externally, uh, but they contradict themselves internally. The Old Testament contains what's known as doublets, where we have multiple accounts of the same story with differing details. Two accounts of creation, one right on the heels of the other, with differing accounts regarding the order in which things were brought into being. Then we have two different accounts of the flood narrative, which conflict uh, regarding the number of animals which are to be brought on the ark. Then the New Testament, we have four Gospels which differ on certain events. Three of them are known as the Synoptic Gospels because they agree on a lot. But even the Synoptics differ to some degree. Then we have the Gospel of John, which has Jesus dying on a different day than the Synoptics. Probably a literary device to to help drive home the point that Jesus is the Lamb of God. And John, as I've heard it described, uh, Jesus doesn't eat a Paschal meal. He essentially is a Paschal meal or Passover meal. Uh, The lamb that dies for the sins of the world. I don't think the authors were trying to be deceitful, and I don't think they probably cared that much that the events or details differed. They weren't writing journalism in the modern sense. They were writing gospels, the good news, trying to at least partially symbolically convey a higher truth. There are people like uh, William Lane Craig who do think the Gospels are factually accurate journalistic accounts, but I don't think that's the mainstream consensus among biblical scholars. To quote or paraphrase Dom Crossan, uh, who I love, um, and he's actually uh, he, he's a theologian, a biblical scholar, and a, a, a actually a, a former priest, I believe. But to paraphrase him, either the gospel writers intended their writings to be taken literally, and we're so smart we know to take them figuratively, 
or they were meant to be taken figuratively, and we're so dumb we insist on taking them literally. And he says he thinks it's the latter, or something to that effect, okay? Then I've been talking about Islam a lot on the show recently, so let's take that as an example. Christianity says Jesus suffered and died on the cross for our sins, and he is the, the risen Son of God. Islam reveres Jesus, but they don't think he's divine, don't think he suffered or died on the cross, and don't think that God has a son. Both religions have countless adherents who believe their faith is right, but obviously someone's wrong, maybe both of them. And I can hear you thinking, but just because all religions can't be right doesn't mean that they're all wrong. One of them could still be right, and you probably think coincidentally that it's your religion that's right. And that's very true. It could be possible that one of the world's main religions is right. I personally doubt it. They all seem obviously man-made to me. If you're going to insist yours is right, then how about some proof? And you'll have to do better than that Psy 10, Eric Hoven, presuppositional, could you be wrong nonsense. And a shout out to Psy 10 Atheists, by the way. Love that guy. But continuing to play devil's advocate, you could also argue that just because religions are man-made, that doesn't mean there's not a higher power. And I actually readily concede that point. I eschew labels, but I'm technically what you would call an agnostic atheist. Agnostic because I believe empirically we can't definitively prove or disprove God's existence. But I'm atheistic because based on what I see as the evidence or lack thereof, I strongly doubt the existence of a higher power or an afterlife. Okay, so reason two, I guess I'll go with consciousness as an emergent property of the brain. Everything we know about the brain seems to imply that consciousness is a product of the brain, and upon death, it's probably lights out. And I know it's a bummer. Uh, <laughs> but think about how if you damage a part of the brain, you can often see corresponding damage to the mind, self, psyche, whatever label you choose. Depending on what part is damaged, you might get impaired impulse control, trouble with long or short-term memory, trouble with the ability to recognize faces, etc. And think about horrible brain diseases like Alzheimer's. As the condition of the brain deteriorates, the self deteriorates as well. People become confused, unable to recognize loved ones, experience severe behavioral changes, etc., and you know, the brain is kind of like a layered onion. If we look at the evolutionary history of the brain, we can see it starts off with the, I'll say, quote unquote, simple, because it's still impressive. You know, the, the, the simple reptilian brain, essentially our brain stem, then it gets more and more complex. Eventually you get up to the mammalian brain. You kind of end up with that outer layer, the, the neocortex, which is uh, responsible for higher reasoning, etc. I think the neocortex is also involved in things like um, sensory perception, motor commands. I actually think it's uh, the neocortex is made up of two different cortexes or something like that. Um, I should probably be fact-checking this stuff. But anyway, kind of an impromptu episode. The only counter-argument I could possibly think of to the idea of consciousness as an emergent property of the brain, I like to kind of test the metal of my own ideas by playing devil's advocate against myself, is that the brain is somehow a receiver of consciousness rather than the source of consciousness. Uh, I think something like this is suggested in Aldous Huxley's Doors of Perception, uh, actually one of my favorite books. But this is pure speculation. The more realistic conclusion at the moment, unfortunately, in my humble opinion, is that's likely that consciousness is simply an emergent property of the brain. And this was going to just be a list of three reasons. I might stretch it to four. But I guess in third place, and, and this is an old hackneyed one, and honestly, for some reason, I don't spend as much time thinking about it anymore as I used to. But I think it still really has merit. And that's the problem of evil. Why would a good God allow suffering, especially on the scale that we often see in this world? The Christian answer would probably be original sin. Two people ate the wrong kind of produce, and now we're all in the shit. And to me, this is honestly a monstrous notion. It doesn't solve the problem of evil. All it does is make God look like some unforgiving tyrant. It's an evil notion that... All of humanity, all subsequent 
generations should be punished and afflicted for the sins of two individuals. People might also bring up the free will argument, which might work to some degree regarding man's inhumanity, the man, but it doesn't help regarding things like natural disasters, tsunamis that wipe out hundreds of thinking, feeling human beings like you and me at a time, nor, you know, horrible diseases and birth defects, etc. It doesn't help explain the horror of the food chain, the fact that life feeds on life. As an animal lover, a hypocritical one, I still eat meat. It's tough to look at something like a predator ripping apart its prey while the light goes out of its eyes and think this is the work of a benevolent creator. I suppose you could argue this doesn't disprove God. There might still be a creator. All this killing and dying might be his, her, or its design. If so, maybe not the nicest guy on the block. I think the cruelty and indifference that we can often see in the natural world makes a lot more sense in the context of evolution and natural selection than it does when you try to reconcile it with uh, the idea of a benevolent God. Then I guess fourth and lastly, I'll, I'll just say simply the lack of evidence for at least an afterlife. You know, what do we have? We have the kind of shoddy evidence we find in those cheesy ghost hunter shows, which my friend Chris Weber does an awesome job of debunking. All we really have is anecdotal stories about near-death experiences, EVPs, electronic voice phenomena, which are pretty much like audio Rorschach tests. Often on those ghost shows, they'll prime the, the viewer or the listener. They'll tell you what it's supposedly saying. Then they play the audio. And even then, it usually seems like a stretch to imagine that's actually saying what they say they're, it's saying. And then we have psychics and mediums who usually seem to be resorting to cold reading and things like that. Is there anyone in the audience whose name begins with a J? John, Jonah, Joanne? Um, did you recently suffer a loss? Did a female member of your family die or whatever? It's as if they're trying to coax the information out of you and make you think that they have some kind of preternatural insight that they actually don't. Then there's all the corny photographic quote-unquote evidence that was abundant during the age of the spiritualist movement, obvious double exposures, people with cheesecloth hanging out of their mouths, um, trying to pass it off as ectoplasm, comically absurd dummies, you know, mannequins placed in photographs, uh, and trying to... Uh, people trying to pass them off as apparitions or whatever. And before I summarize my reasons once again, I'll say in a spirit of fairness that if I had to pick something that makes me question my unbelief, it wouldn't be the fine-tuning argument, which I think the late great Christopher Hitchens said that was the one that gave him pause. To me, that, for some reason, maybe... Um, I'm not looking at it right. It simply seems to me like a matter of almost cosmic natural selection. I've never really been bothered by the fine-tuning argument. For me, it's probably the fact that there's something instead of nothing. I understand the concept of the Big Bang as much as, you know, a human <laughs> possibly can. Um, sometimes these big cosmological ideas can be hard to wrap our uh, heads around. But still, you know, you know, but where did the cosmic ingredients for the Big Bang that allowed it to happen come from? You know, where did that first singularity come from? What allowed it to take place? What allowed that initial hot, dense state, you know, to even exist? And I think there's people like Lawrence Krauss and Stephen Hawking who have um, good ideas, about how something could indeed come from quote-unquote nothing. Uh, but it's kind of above my pay grade. Lawrence Krauss talks about this kind of bubbling quantum brew that you can consider nothing in a sense that could have allowed uh, you know, the universe to come into being. And some people accuse him of playing word games, calling something nothing when it's actually still something. But in fairness, as I've said often on the show, I think both science 
and religion kind of suffer from the problem of infinite regress. As you can see, j just what I was talking about, we're still struggling with the problem of what preceded the Big Bang or how something can come from nothing. And with the religious, you know, if you, you say, they'll say, well, everything comes from God. God always was. Well, isn't that convenient? How do you know God always was? Because it's implied in your man-made holy book. So I do admit that that's the thing that probably plagues me the most. How can something come from nothing? But even then, it's a pretty big leap to go from this gap in our knowledge to the God of the Bible is real. Yeah, so for me, just, you know, the man-made nature of religion, consciousness, seemingly an emergent property of the brain, the problem of evil, and the lack of evidence. Those are my reasons for doubting the existence of God or an afterlife. There might be other ones too, but they're not coming to the forefront right now. So I hope someone got something out of this episode. All right, later.